Welcome to the Business Radio Network. Enjoy Small Biz, Big Voices with Stephanie Rising. Hi, I'm Stephanie Rising, a business coach and author in beautiful Tucson, Arizona. Today, it's my pleasure to speak with wellness practitioners Sarah Cotton of Gut Instinct Wellness and Dr. Stephanie Stark of Blue Oak Clinic. Our interview will conclude with a Proust lightning round, and our final segment will be Dear Coach, when I'll coach listeners through issues they've emailed in. First, I'd like to welcome my guests. Sarah Cotton is an integrative health specialist and founder of Gut Instinct Wellness. The art and science of healthy living has been her lifelong passion. At an early age, she clearly noted the mental and emotional roots in her mother's struggle with Crohn's disease and other illnesses. The quest for a deeper understanding of that stress disease link inspired her work in somatic experiencing trauma resolution and functional nutrition. She has been in private practice since 2012. Dr. Stephanie Stark is a licensed naturopathic physician. After interning with a variety of practitioners, she was inspired to make a true difference in people's lives. Stephanie received additional training in primary care and enjoys seeing patients of all ages and backgrounds. She is especially adept with women's health, pediatric issues, and thyroid issues. She and her husband, Artisher, who is also a naturopathic physician, started Blue Oak Clinic in 2007 and have since grown a loyal following. Sarah and Stephanie, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have both of you here today. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, having for having us. I think, uh, you know, this show is really geared toward small business owners and business professionals and health plays such a large part in our ability to show up in our work, not to mention you know, our lives in general. So I'm happy to have you here to tell us how we can be healthier. Um, both of you chose non-traditional paths in the health and wellness field. So I'd like to start by clarifying some terms. And Stephanie, I'll start with you. What is the difference between allopathic and naturopathic medicine? Certainly. So allopathic um, means conventional. So I'm putting doctor in quotes. Everybody's doctor that they go to is basically an allopathic doctor, most folks at least. Um, and we are probably more similar than people think. Um, the best way I can describe it is naturopathic medicine is sort of the way medicine used to be, where a doctor had time mm -hmm. to figure out why the person was having their symptoms and try to get to the root cause of that. Unfortunately, it's now an industry um, with a lot of profit behind it, and doctors are encouraged. Actually, the AMA does encourage uh, providers to keep their visits under six minutes. Wow. And we, so how can you really spend time, um, quality time, with the patient trying to understand um, why they've come into the office. Um, but basically, there, there are more similarities than differences. Um, so the similarities are that we're both um, looking to solve the problem of the person in front of us. I do not take insurance, and so I can spend however much time that I need with the person to figure that out. In naturopathic medicine, we do look to get to the root cause of a health issue mm -hmm. while eliminating what we call obstacles to cure. So it's hmm. things that are standing in the person's way of getting better. So um, what, what we do that's similar is the doctor gets your complaints down. That's the subjective. The objective is that you do physical exam. You might do lab work. You might do imaging. Um, and then basically the big difference is that we have many different options. And so while I do prescribe prescription drugs, I have so many different things in my tool belt. I can do um, whatever the person needs. So I, I always say I meet the person where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, but I do function as a primary care provider for a good number of my patients, similarly to my allopathic colleagues. Interesting. And, I, you know, I, I've been uh, a naturopathic patient for many years now and recently and thankfully became yours. And I think one of the things that I really appreciate about your method is um, I don't know any other doctor who will spend 45 minutes with me and, and actually talk about what's going on in my life and things that aren't just like you said. I mean, that average of six minutes, what can you really get to know about other variables that could be affecting that person's health. So I don't want to just take a pill. I really want to understand what's going on and get to the root cause. So um, I'm a fan. <laughs> and yeah, your, your explanation was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And then Sarah, your area of expertise is in the gut brain connection. Describe for us what that means. And also, how does that relate to somatic experiencing? Mm hmm. 
Yeah, so I'm a digestive health specialist and help folks find freedom from digestive problems and IBS, uh, uh, as well as um, freedom from depression, fatigue, brain fog, anxiety, sleep issues, all symptoms that tend to go along with IBS or digestive conditions. Hmm. Um, and, you know, when the gut isn't working right, when there's inflammation and dysfunction in, in the gut, there will be effects on the nervous system and the brain and the mental emotional health. Um, so likewise, uh, patterns of chronic stress or unresolved trauma um, will uh, cause changes in the hormones and in the nervous system that then can give rise to digestive issues uh, like IBS. Um, so it's hmm. really a, a two-way super highway of connectivity between the gut and the brain um, mitigated by a lot of different factors. Um, and I'm really passionate about testing for and discovering parasitic infections um, and other imbalances in the gut microbiome mm -hmm. um, that can really di uh, drive digestive symptoms, of course, but also they can interfere with nutrient absorption, they drive inflammation, they can cause issues with stress hormones, and um, this will affect the brain. So that can trigger you know, brain fog, depression, insomnia, fatigue, anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, so when we can remove the infections, we can really restore that, that healthy bacteria, that healthy microbiome. So we're lightening the load on the body and the brain so someone can you know, think clearly, feel calm, sleep well, have energy. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm also very passionate about um, kind of coming at it from the other side and looking at what is going on with the stress patterns in the body. So um, that's where this practice of somatic experiencing comes in, which is a stress and trauma resolution practice and kind of looks like talk therapy. We sit in chairs and we talk about life, um, but it's not so much just about the intellectual story of kind of what stressors or traumas may have happened. It's mm -hmm. paying attention to how stress is showing up in the body and then from there unwinding those stress patterns in the body. Um, and this just marries beautifully with um, lightening the stress load in the digestive system by um, getting rid of parasites and, and balancing the microbiome. So we're really therapeutically and holistically addressing that gut-brain connection. And one of the things that I learned from you is that the gut functions as like a second brain and that your gut actually has neurons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which is yeah. fascinating. Yeah. The digestive system has as many neurons as a cat's brain. Really? <laughs> and it has more than uh, the spinal column. Well, I used to have cats, and I'm not sure if I find that to be <laughs> encouraging or discouraging, given their behavior at times. So <laughs> it explains a lot about my gut. <laughs> There's a lot going on in there. Oh, uh, yeah. And some of it's spastic. Um, so how, how have you both, I'm curious, um, you know, this is, uh, you both described methodologies that are different from just that, the straightforward Western approach. So have you found that your methodologies are embraced or are they greeted with a certain measure of suspicion because it, it is different and it is outside the box and it's not outside the box because it's woo-woo in any way. It just isn't what we were raised to believe. We were raised to believe that the six-minute appointment and a pill will fix our problem. So, Sarah, what have you encountered in your practice? Yeah, I mean, I found um, generally um, a good, um, respectful connection and communication with um, medical practitioners that I've been in connection with when we have mutual clients and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, you know, what I do is science-based, so if mm -hmm. we can have that conversation. Um, usually things generally go well. And, and I think also, you know, there's a growing recognition that um, it can really uh, take a team um, to find true wellness um, in terms of, you know, um, not just seeing the allopathic or conventional doctor, but also having someone like me, a nutritioner, pra nutrition practitioner on board, a naturopath on board, and that that wellness can take this kind of team approach. Um, and you know, so I provide um, high level therapeutic coaching, both emotionally and in terms of nutrition and daily habits. Um, and I think a lot of doctors do recognize that that is just not something that they have the training in or the time to do, um, but that there's a need for it. So they don't resist it. They are, they're embracing this as a complement to their particular 
business model? I would say the doctors that I've been in communication with when we've, we've had mutual clients slash patients, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, however, heard from many of my clients um, expressions of frustration with, in particular, conventional gastroenterologists who will mm-hmm. tell them, you know, things like, and this may be a client who already understands some holistic principles such as food is medicine. And mm-hmm. then the doctor tells them, <clears throat> you know, uh, something like, well, what you eat isn't going to make a difference with your IBS or with your Crohn's disease, which to me, that, that doesn't make sense. Um, and doesn't make sense to the client. And and so there's frustration there. Um, and so, you know, then I can kind of fulfill that gap that's, that's there where they do need support in terms of, well, what, what foods are going to be triggering more inflammation and causing these symptoms? What can we, what foods can we add in, um, Mm -hmm. to, you know, nourish a healthy microbiome and, and, um, resolve symptoms. And Stephanie, what about you being a naturopath and not a, like a straight uh, allopath? How how are you embraced by your colleagues or even just the perception by the, the public of what you do compared to a more quote unquote conventional doctor? Well, I've definitely had both ends of the spectrum. And <laughs> so um, and definitely many uh, other providers who were skeptical and then you just win them over over time because it is science-based mm-hmm. um, and and you're all look you're supposed to just be looking out for the patient and so if right. something is serving that person well then anyone needs to pay attention we're fortunate here in Tucson because we have Andrew well integrative um, school here, the mm-hmm. Integrated Medicine Department at U of A. So definitely there are some colleagues who are already open-minded just right out of the gate. That probably for me, when I, I refer to specialists every day, so I have we have a cardiologist we love, we have a gastroenterologist we love, there's nearly every specialty we have someone that it may have taken some time to win them over. Mm-hmm. And now they'll tell their patients, I'll give an example of an endocrinologist. And I referred to make sure the person didn't have Addison's disease, which is when your adrenals aren't making enough cortisol. So mm. not just that they're low functioning, but literally flagged by the lab. And so these are the kinds of things folks like us know that we catch it and they need to be seen by a specialist. And the specialist then says, well, you know, it's not bad enough to be Addison's, but you, you, you could probably take some herbs or something. You, you Go back and see her. She'll, she'll give you something Hmm. for it, but you don't need drugs for it. And so this is someone that we've had many patients in common, and they may have started out thinking that we were very different, but really in the end, we're just trying to help the patient. Um, And then even um, it's often the husband that gets, you know, dragged in. My wife made me come. (laughs) And so usually, you know, you can kind of tell how it's going to go. But very often it's it's engineers that are the ones that sit there with their arms folded and thinking, you know, this really isn't for me. And as soon as someone has relief, um, then they really see no matter if it's a pill, if it's an herb, whatever it is, if it's food then they they went they're won over whether it's the provider or the patient and it is science based it i mean is. there is data that's driving your diagnosis and driving your your methods to cure tons yeah yeah engineers are tricky <laughs> oh they're i love those patients <laughs> we we love my father-in-law was an engineer and nice. i'm enormously fond of them it does take a little bit of time and a little bit of patience to just break down that barrier of initial disbelief. <laughs> you know, I have a lot. I bet Sarah does too. They're definitely, you know, they're smart folks and yeah. they have a lot of engineers as patients. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that I also wanted to ask the the two of you, you know, I was, I was thinking about our conversation today and some of the things that I wanted to ask you. And one thing that I wanted to express on on everyone's behalf is just the frustration of trying to make a good decision about our health. And uh, my husband and I were fans of The Good Place. Did you ever see that show? You like mm-hmm. that show? I've seen it. Yeah, my yeah. daughter loves it. Oh, I love that show. <laughs> uh, there's a, a, like an episode toward the end of the series, and they're talking about how difficult it is to be a human being and make good choices about so many different things every single day. And they brought up the example of, well, like, just look at trying to be healthy. You try and eat more blueberries because they're high in antioxidants, but then you find out that, like, the working conditions of the farmer are terrible. And so every time you think you're making a good decision, there's this unintended consequence. So I think, well, I'm supposed to eat more fish because it's a healthy, lean protein, but then I'm increasing my chances of um, increasing mercury in my system. Or um, what's another example? You're trying to be more plant-based because you want to be more eco-friendly. 
but then you find out that your iron levels are dropping. And sometimes it's just, it's really maddening. And I don't know when food got this complicated. <laughs> so what advice do you have for people who are just trying to make good choices? And Sarah, I'll start with you on this one. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of thoughts there. Uh, the first is testing. Um, so working mm. with a great naturopathic doctor like Dr. Stark um, or a functional medicine provider and um, really doing the lab work, um, blood work and other kinds of lab testing to understand your levels, you know, having your, your nutrient levels tested um, and really being thorough about how you're assessing your your health and having mm. a holistic practitioner to guide you in that assessment. Um I know, for one, you know, I'm also a patient of Dr. Stark's, and in their clinic, they're they're really looking at um, the blood work from a deeper level and um, uh, doing blood work more often, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which is fantastic because you you know you're gonna see is you, did you did you cut um, meat out and eat more plant based and that's when your iron went down. Is it that directly related or is it not? Um, hmm. Was it happening a little bit before? Um, and so you can start to connect the dots and understand what's causing what in a very um, experiential way. Um, and then the other is uh, the other thought I have about that is tuning into the wisdom of your body. Um, so really listening to the subtle signs. There's a, a book um, by Bessel van der, van der Kolk uh, called um, Your Body Keeps a Score. And mm. just that title I like um, in terms of, uh, you know, Tuning in to um, the sensations, the um, different energy levels, um, the the things that might seem really subtle, the the moments that feel good in your body or in your day, mm -hmm. um, the kind of nuance of just being a human. If you can um, be a little more meditative and mindful, um, your body will tell you a lot about what is actually nourishing for you, what what foods are best for you, what you know, health practices are best for you. Hmm. Um, there's there's a lot of wisdom um, in the body. And listening to it without being overwhelmed by it. And maybe yeah. the overwhelm yeah. is coming externally, yeah. you know, more yeah. hearing what everyone else thinks you should be doing mm -hmm. instead of just listening mm -hmm. to your mm -hmm. own inner voice, which mm -hmm. actually leads me um, to part two of this question. And I'll direct this to you, Stephanie, that... Uh, the global wellness market was estimated to reach $4.75 trillion at the close of 2019. And I, you know, kind of piggybacking on what Sarah was just saying, with that much information and choice that's flooding the market, what have been some of the most common misperceptions you've encountered with your patients? What do you think is causing this confusion and overwhelm where people are just trying to make a good decision and they don't even know where to start? Yeah, well, it's too much information for one. And people, they're online all day. So, yeah. um, and, you know, definitely your friend does something. And so, oh, you know, many people are, they want to be healthier. They want to lose weight or they, people are just trying to find happiness in some way, mm -hmm. but it's just too much information. And so I liked what Sarah said. My background is in nutrition and I got my degree in 98 from UT Austin. And back then we would say healthy eating is, and we say, I say the same thing now. I mean, you don't have to be perfect all the time. And yeah. so it's enjoying life. And if you're someone that you're able to be moderate with your food choices, then sometimes you you eat just what your friends are eating. Um, but I think, unfortunately, um, people often do need a coach or a provider that mm -hmm. helps them to be able to navigate their way through. I do think the best thing is that um, folks give something a shot. And so, um, you know, people can do elimination diets if they don't have the means to see a provider to, that does lab testing. And a lot of this is online. It's just really where you look. Um, looking at the websites for naturopathic physicians, the ones who are licensed, um, hmm. versus people who can get just a mail order traditional naturopath degree, there's definitely a difference in the schooling. Um, and, and even like she mentioned, functional medicine providers who are allopathic folks who go back to school basically to be able to learn sort of naturopathic or holistic techniques. But really seeing a provider who's educated honestly saves a lot of time and headache because it's it's confusing. Mm -hmm. Are there any any websites like if if people are online and they're trying to get information, mm -hmm. how do you know a reliable, good website versus one that's either has its own agenda or they haven't updated their information? 
where should we be going? I would say that, so you can go to naturopathic.org. That's the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians. And you can find a doctor and find folks in your area. And many times you can just poke around and look at people's websites and their blogs. So that's all just great information. Um, it's IFM is the Institute for mm-hmm. Functional Medicine, right? Mm-hmm. And so they also, you can find providers. Uh, Institute for Natural Medicine is my profession's nonprofit arm. Um, and then you just sort of, you, you know, follow people that you like. So there's, um, I really like Aviva Ram. She's a medical doctor who was originally a midwife and herbalist. And I, you, know, you really trust what someone like that has to say. Um, Mark Hyman is a famous functional medicine doctor, and we're all talking about the same stuff. It's that our low quality food supply is just bought and paid for, and mm-hmm. we just have to eat what grows out of Mother Earth. And yeah. even the medicines that are on this planet, we're coming back to now in the face of diseases where we don't know how to treat it. Yeah. Um, so, but but yeah, those are some good websites. I'm sure Sarah knows mm-hmm. them too, huh? Those are the ones I was thinking. Okay, great. Yeah, nice. perfect. Oh, good. Then I'll make sure those go in the, in the uh, show notes. Can I circle back to uh, the overwhelm that you were talking about? Yes, please. So in terms of the overwhelm of, you know, too much information out there, not knowing what to make of the symptoms that you might be experiencing, plus the overwhelm of just having symptoms and maybe feeling scared. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a practice called taking in the good which is learning to notice small moments of pleasure or goodness or even Mm. just kind of a feeling of (laughs) okayness or Mm. neutralness Um, and developing a mindful practice where you really stop and notice, ooh, I love the way my warm cup of tea feels in my hands or I get to sit in my most comfy chair at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Those little moments are deeply informative in terms of what's nourishing for for your system. Um, And they are a beautiful antidote to the overwhelm and help shift the body out of a kind of fight or flight stress state and into Mm -hmm. one that's um, more relaxed and more level headed. And not only can that help with physical symptoms, it can also help navigate um, that process of discovering, you know, what is most nourishing for you? What foods, what practices, how should I live? Who should I see as a doctor? Um, If you can be in that more parasympathetic or um, relaxation state, um, that's very helpful. That's really good advice and a good observation because especially, you know, again, this podcast is geared toward um, business owners, but really any adult human being is running around trying to balance work with family, with having a little rest and relaxation, with having some fun. And it seems like we're always juggling. And so when things come up for with our health, we treat it like anything else. It's like mm-hmm. we're always on the hunt for a problem and we're always on a hunt for a solution. And it's it's almost like we're a hammer and everything looks like a nail. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think just sitting with it and being reflective instead of automatically going into some sort of knee-jerk mm-hmm. action, mm-hmm. trying to force a solution, mm-hmm. um, it's a really good habit mm-hmm. to get into. And not just with your health, but probably mm-hmm. any problem that, that you're facing. So mm-hmm. that's an excellent suggestion. Uh, We're going to take just a quick break. This is Small Biz Big Voices, hosted by Stephanie Rising. I'm a small business coach on a mission to get business owners off their hamster wheel and empower them as authentic and influential leaders. My coaching program centers around the seven primal business needs. Today, I'm visiting with Sarah Cotton of Gut Instinct Wellness and Dr. Stephanie Stark of Blue Oak Clinic. Um, and this piggybacks on on what we were talking about before the, the break. One of the reasons uh, I personally have been so excited to work with the two of you, and I'm excited to share you with everyone on the show, is the, the topic of food allergies. So I never had food allergies as a kid. And then I turned 40, and all of a sudden I'm getting eczema I cannot get rid of, insomnia I can't get rid of. Um, and I wind up testing positive for gluten, dairy, eggs, and almonds, which, of course, I was eating all the time. And then it it seems like I have so many peers who now also have food allergies, and they didn't have them as kids either. And people younger than ourselves are either being born with food allergies or they're finding out about them a lot sooner. And so one question I have, and Stephanie, I'll start with you, is 
was this always an issue that simply went misdiagnosed and it was just disguised as something else or treated as something else? Or are we really dealing with a phenomenon? And is that attached to what you were talking about earlier with what we are doing with industrialized agriculture? I would say both. Okay. And so we, yes, of course, there's a higher prevalence now for allergies and asthma and behavioral disorders and things like that. Some of those things may not have, people didn't know, and now we just have um, so much more information out there. I'll give the example of someone with um, asthma or eczema um, who has a dairy intolerance. It's very common, Mm -hmm. and that has probably been like that for a long time. Um, And so Hmm. people just did not know, and people still don't know, but I know. And so for me, more than 9 out of 10 of my patients, if they have eczema or um, uh, eczema or asthma and even sore throats, recurrent sore throats and sinus infections and ear infections, it's it's very frequently dairy. And were we ever supposed to be eating so much? Maybe not. So that could be part of it. Also, just the, the chemical exposure, there are hundreds of thousands now of chemicals that have been developed that we just don't know the impact. Um, And then basically things start to happen as we age. This is aging. And so as our gene mutations that we've inherited from our parents begin to Mm. kick in and we are essentially rusting. And so our enzymes Mm. now require more nutrients to be able to work to give that end result. Um, this is the process of aging. And so that's why people say, how, how did this happen? I was well five years ago. And as soon as I hit, it's very common. As soon as I hit a certain age, I started falling apart. Um, and that's just because your, your body requires more. And so something's got to give. And then it's just like the straw that breaks the camel's back or the extra bucket of water that's, that's filled into the big, at some point it's going to spill over. And another example of that is someone with, um, with allergies and we take them off of dairy, say for heartburn or for asthma, whatever it is. And they come back and they say, did you, how, how, you didn't tell me that taking out dairy would make my allergies better. How did that happen? It was always an intolerance or probably, you know, for a long time had been an intolerance. And once Hmm. you remove an obstacle to cure or a burden on the body, the body's freed up to be able to deal with something it was uh, um, otherwise unable to deal with. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of factors for sure. I don't know the answers to all of it, but sort of going back to the basics, um, I think is probably always a good idea. I'm going to have to share that with my dad. And dad, if you're listening, I really hate to break this to you, but your ice cream addiction may have something to do with your asthma. So <laughs> we're we're going to be talking about that. Uh, <laughs> I'm the bummer doctor. I say I <laughs> <laughs> we'll find something else. There are some really delicious non dairy ice creams out there. These there days. are. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, the so delicious ones that are made out of cashew milk. Those are yummy. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Sarah, for you, with the you were talking about how the gut, the brain, and the nervous system are all connected. So, what are some of the ways in which you know whether it's Crohn's disease, like your mom had, or whether it's food allergies? How how does that disease disrupt that connection? Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, allergies are really a inflammatory response happening in the immune system um, where the immune system is becoming uh, overly active and attacking otherwise benign substances like the dairy or the egg proteins. Um, and this overactive immune system and inflammatory response um, can get out of control and be uh, kind of systemic. Um, And uh, so if somebody is in that inflamed state, eating foods that they are allergic to and having that inflammation kind of running amok, that can lead to further problems with the with the immune system where Mm. um, it can be sort of on overdrive. um, And then a person is predisposed to developing autoimmunity where the immune system is not only attacking the dairy uh, protein, it's also erroneously starting to attack human tissue. So in Crohn's disease, attacking the lining of the gut, Hmm. or in rheumatoid arthritis, attacking the joints, or in Hashimoto's thyroiditis, attacking the thyroid gland. Um, And so uh, that that connection um, between the um, allergic response and autoimmunity is is very intimate. Um, And, uh, you know, once that autoimmune process is going in the body that's going to be uh, putting a burden on um, stress hormones. It's going to be driving Hmm. 
driving inflammation, um, which can, in fact, actually now they're discovering uh, get into the brain. There can be brain inflammation as a source for um, uh, mental health disorders, as, as well as our Alzheimer's. This is all new research coming out about um, the microglia, which are uh, immune cells in the in the brain. Um, so it's all it's all very complex and intimately conne connected, and also kind of cutting edge. And we don't have necessarily the um, uh, you know finished studies on this stuff, but it's um, it's all very exciting. Well, it, and it's really interesting to kind of if if you're dealing with a certain set of um, issues. I mean, I'll just use myself as an example with food allergies and you're working backwards from there. Like how did your bucket reach to the point where it's overflowing and mm -hmm. now your immune system is just on the war path? And, and as the two of you were describing all that occurred to me that I am allergic to cats. I always have been, but for whatever insane reason, I chose to have two cats for like eight years mm -hmm. because I was, I was really busy. It wasn't fair to have a dog, even though, you know, I was raised with, I love dogs. I always had those, um, them as pets growing up. But when I moved out and was working and I wanted to have pets, I got cats. So it would be more, my schedule would be more fair. But living with cat dander and cat hair for eight years when I was allergic to it, even though I was careful about not touching my face and, you know, there were things that I thought I was doing to mitigate the effect. Um, I'm realizing I probably did myself zero favors mm. and maybe that's why I can't have toast, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't, mm -hmm. but just kind of looking at the, at that connection for people out there who are wondering, like, how did I get to this point? Mm -hmm. Um, that's really, it's a pretty complicated puzzle and there may be pieces of it that we never would have considered. Mm -hmm. So a similar story, almost like an inverse to that. Um, my husband had terrible cat allergies his whole life and asthma, and um, even to the point where he'd be having to go to ER if he was in a, a house with a lot of cats. Um, and when he removed um, gluten from his diet, mm -hmm. uh, he had already removed dairy, but once he removed gluten completely from his diet, um, his cat allergy is almost completely gone his mother really? has a cat he visits her every day he's he's fine um so n he still struggles with some allergy issues but um but that made a huge difference was like it's that analogy of you know the the cup being full yeah um and so when you remove the the response to the gluten the the it's like removing some some from the cup so it's not overflowing and 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 he's becoming symptomatic anymore Hmm. So I have to say, really though, that unfortunately, on the other side of the coin, it's that um, the immune system can kind of get distracted. And so sometimes if the person has an illness, they'll actually find something else gets better. Like say they huh. have lupus and they have joint pain and they have an illness, the body will go after that and their their arthritic symptoms get better or something. So it it's definitely the immune system is definitely complicated. Yeah. But sometimes it is actually that that can benefit the immune system by taking on something that is a burden. So if I get cats again, I can have toast? <laughs> I mean, let's flip the coin. We'll, we'll see which one it is. <laughs> Whatever it takes at this point. Um, something that I came across that I found really interesting and made me think of, of the two of you is that there's a, a biometric company in California that's experimenting with temporary tattoos that help people make better health choices. So the the one that I saw measures sun exposure. So they put this little temporary tattoo on you and it starts to turn colors. The circle will become saturated with color. And when the whole thing is filled in, you know you've been out and about long enough to get your natural vitamin D. But at this point, it's time to seek shade and protect your skin. And it made me curious about other wellness trends that are on the horizon. And, and Sarah, I'll start with you. What innovations have have you heard of, well, you know, tech or otherwise? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, this is something that most people know about, but can't be underestimated in terms of how beneficial it is. There are some really fantastic uh, meditation apps out there. Hmm. Uh, there's one called Calm. There's another one called Headspace. Um, I recommend them to all of my clients. Um, it can be very helpful to have guidance with meditation. Um, it's probably better to go to a class. Uh, but if you can't swing that in terms of your schedule, the, the apps are really helpful and they have, um, you know, positive psychology 
motivation built into them. They give you little, you know, encouragement along the way and yeah. reminders and things like that. And um, it's it's a simple thing, but um, I truly, truly believe in the power of meditation to change our bodies and our minds and ultimately our world. Um, I think it's really powerful. Uh, and so those apps are just um, simple and useful because if you can get yourself meditating every day, it will improve your life and your health significantly. So it's like using technology to help us practice something ancient, actually. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that we desperately need in part because of this age of information and the overwhelm. So maybe there's an irony yeah. there, but uh, <laughs> they're, they're well designed. The apps are, are uh, very useful. Yeah. Stephanie, how about you? What's uh, What have you seen on the horizon? Sure. So one of those I would agree, it's, it also falls under technology. And that is um, folks, especially in rural areas, who are able to see a provider virtually. So I mm. think um, I don't, I'm not so great with that kind of thing personally, but I know there is a, a healthcare facility, I think they're in New York City, called Parsley Health. And it's a functional medicine um, MD. And they now have a platform where they're able, able to provide care virtually for mm. folks. So for some people, it's that's really the only way that they would be able to see a provider such as Sarah or myself. So that, um, and then I guess the other thing I would say is uh, it's not new, it's old, just returning to nature and including even when we think about you know, flu outbreak or coronavirus or anything, we think about what, is there anything on this earth that might be possible to help our immune ses systems um, and to help to, to uh, reduce the severity and duration of yeah. X, Y, Z. And one of those things is vitamin C IVs. I mean, if you Google mm -hmm. NPR yeah. sepsis vitamin C, it is the leading treatment for sepsis, truly sepsis, the deadly mm -hmm. disease. Um, and actually, there is a lot of there is definitely some um, some research coming out of China that the the folks who are being treated with both oral and IV vitamin C are doing far well than everyone else. Really, absolutely. Um, and so, antivirals, you know, A, C, D, zinc. Um, there's some possible correlation with low levels of selenium. All of this is out there, and so the good thing about technology is people can cut to the chase and just go to PubMed.gov. That's where all of the scientific literature is. Um, of course, there's always some bit of bias in, in certain folks' research, but it cuts through a, all of the other stuff out there and goes really true the science journals. So someone could just plug in vitamin C sepsis, and it's mm -hmm. not a website owner's um, opinion about it, the, uh, the actual research. But we know that when levels drop um, of certain things like A and C and D and zinc and selenium, we're more susceptible to things like viruses. So I really think that the wave of the future is just remembering what's helped us for all of these years. Hmm. And that was uh, one of the sites that you just mentioned. It was PubMed.com. Gov. That's so correct. it's all the published data. That's right. So all awesome. of the scientific journals are there. Sometimes you can't read the whole one, but for most folks, if you can just read the abstract and just look at the conclusion at the bottom, you can at least see if it's worthwhile to get the whole paper. Okay. This was great information. Thank you so much. We're going to be uh, highlighting some of those websites as well as your information in the show notes. You can learn more about Gut Instinct and Blue Oak Clinic at gutinstinct.clinic and blueoakclinic.com. Uh, next is our Proust lightning round. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> All right. The Proust Questionnaire was a parlor game made popular by the French essayist and novelist Marcel Proust. He believed that by answering 35 specific questions, an individual reveals their true nature. We're going to go through as many questions as we can in just a few minutes. All right. Question one. Which living person do you most admire? Sarah. Michelle Obama. Steph. My mom. What is your greatest extravagance? My love of interior design. <laughs> Housekeeper, 100%. Oh, yes. Two thumbs up Sorry, on that one. Sorry, my mom is tied with Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> it's close. Maybe it's Bernie, actually. It's a close. <laughs> <laughs> what is your current state of mind? A little giddy. <laughs> goofy. Goofy. Giddy and goofy. Good states of mind. What do you consider the most overrated virtue? Symmetry. Hmm. 
says the interior designer. Interesting. Oh, gosh, patience popped into my head, but I know that's not true. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's hard to think of a virtue that's overrated. Patience can be overrated depending on the circumstances. Yeah, I agree. Some people take a little too long. <laughs> on what occasion do you lie? When I'm trying not to hurt someone's feelings. Yeah. When I'm trying to take care of myself. Mm, interesting. I. Uh, I won't make you elaborate, but I actually know <laughs> what you mean. Uh, and lastly, what is the quality you most like in a person? Kindness. Mm. Mm. I agree. I would also say mm. open-mindedness. Yes. Great. Thank you. I didn't give you those in advance. I like the spontaneous answers the best. You did great. I'd love to have you both chime in at the end of our last segment. Dear Coach gives our listeners the chance to have their emailed questions addressed. And today's Dear Coach is about public speaking tips. Public speaking is an excellent way to gain visibility and credibility for your business. But it also happens to be among one of the most feared activities for most people. With practice you might actually enjoy having the chance to share information that is genuinely helpful to others. I personally have a serious shy streak and I used to hate public speaking. I had to consciously imagine swiveling a spotlight onto the audience so I felt the attention was on them. By doing that, I actually began to understand that I was there to be of service to the audience, not an object for their scrutiny. And once I flipped that switch in my head, I had a lot of really fulfilling opportunities to help other people. It just took some practice. So here's what I learned. First, a good preliminary strategy is to seek out smaller, more intimate environments where you can practice and gain confidence. If you belong to a networking group, offer to serve on the leadership team or on a committee where you have to present reports to your group on a regular basis. Remember to practice a bit beforehand to make sure your delivery is engaging and natural. This is an excellent way to gain speaking experience in familiar territory. Next, if you belong to a larger professional organization or club, ask if you can make a short presentation to the group. You'd be surprised how fast five to 10 minutes can fly by. Once you introduce yourself, share a few topics that could help your audience, and then make your closing statements, you won't even know where the time went. I write everything out and then I walk around my house while practicing my presentation. I probably look crazy to my neighbors, but by the time I show up, I've already rehearsed so many times out loud, I know the material in my bones. If being a lone speaker feels too unnerving, there may be opportunities to serve on a panel of speakers who are covering a topic where you have expertise. Serving on a panel is another way to more comfortably grow accustomed to being on stage since you won't solely be in the spotlight. In the company of your colleagues, you might also discover that you know more than you give yourself credit for. That alone is a confidence boost. Again, all of this is about gaining a comfort level and a natural public presence. After you have some informal speaking experience under your belt, consider making a longer presentation and start to broaden the venue possibilities. A good deal of effort will need to be devoted to speaking at this level. It might be more convenient to recycle material rather than reinvent the wheel, but just make sure that you continue to infuse your basic outline with relevant information. Weaving current events or new industry trends into your presentation will make sure your material doesn't grow dull. Remember that all of these efforts are about progress, not perfection. Start small and just expand from there. You might be pleasantly surprised at how much your public speaking confidence will grow. We have a few minutes left, and so I wanted to open it back up to Sarah and Stephanie. What is your advice to people who are starting to dip their toes into the public speaking waters? Did you ever have to overcome any nerves? How, do you, how did you do that? I think I'm pretty lucky that I feel comfortable in front of people because I have a background in theater. Oh, okay. But I guess what I would say is if you're an expert on something, um, then know that and just you can pretend like you're talking to the one patient or the one client that you have. Mm -hmm. And there's a room full of other folks, but you know it because it's your material. And so as long as yeah. you feel completely, like you said, in your bones, as long as you feel comfortable with that, I would just say just to picture yourself speaking with one person. That's a good idea. 
Mm-hmm. And I would say that, um, you know, self-confidence, well, uh, speaking publicly comes from uh, self-confidence within yourself. So having mm-hmm. some kind of um, practice of um, self-compassion, self-love, um, loving kindness for your own self, and that can be um, a meditative practice, that can be a faith-based practice, um, whatever it is that kind of um, floats your boat in terms of um, uh, how, how you uh, grow as a person. Uh, Brene mm. Brown is a great resource for yeah. for some of that work in terms of um, understanding your self-worth and, and really respecting your own self in your life. Uh, that will naturally come through when you're public speaking. And I, that's something that I, I find myself encouraging people um, a lot is to give yourself as much grace as you would give to a friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're we're so hard on ourselves, especially yeah. us uh, type A go getters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can be an active practice to deprogram that and have a little kindness for our own selves. Yes, yeah. so go get the Calm app. <laughs> <laughs> that brings us to the end of today's episode. If you have a question or problem you'd like for us to talk about during our Dear Coach segment, please email me at stephanie at therisingeffect.com. I invite you to follow the show on our Small Biz Big Voices Facebook page, which includes show notes and announcements for upcoming shows. Next month, I'll be speaking with three board members of the Tucson LGBT Chamber of Commerce. We'll discuss the economic impact of the LGBT community, how to create a more inclusive work culture, and ways we can be better allies to our fellow Tucsonans. My thanks to today's guests, Sarah Cotton and Dr. Stephanie Stark, to my producer, Mark Bishop, and to you for joining us on Small Biz, Big Voices. Mm -hmm.